God is an eternal being. He exists beyond the limits of time. In other words, he does not have a beginning or an end. However, everything he does on earth is time bound. The earth itself was created in the beginning within a six day period. It is exactly the same principle that works in all of God's dealings with man. When you pray to God, believing that a certain thing will happen in your life, you must learn to wait patiently, especially when it is something very significant. God will consider your capacity. A very vital implication of being a Christian is that you belong to God. You cannot live by your own dictates because God owns your life. This is so clearly spelt out in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. What? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Because you were purchased at a cost, glorify God in your body and spirit, which are God's. When you truly understand this, you will not be self-willed and rebellious towards God. Some of the troubles you face are traceable to your refusal to align your life with the plans and purposes of God. As a result of this attitude, you are more likely to struggle with and even fight avoidable spiritual conflicts. So James said, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4 verse 7. It is not all about you and what you are believing God for. God can clearly unveil his purpose for your life, but it will happen gradually and in stages as he prepares you. Trying to fulfill God's purpose in the flesh will fail woefully, so you need to walk in synchrony with him and follow his timing. This was what Moses found out as a young prince in Egypt when he sought to free his people, the Jews, from slavery and oppression. He was zealous but foolish, and it got him into trouble. He fled to the land of Midian, where God met him and trained him for the huge task ahead of him. God did several things for Moses during this period. He gave him a specific message for Pharaoh and a message to the leaders of the Jews. He appointed an assistant for him, Aaron, his own brother. He equipped him with supernatural power. All these vital things were part of his strategy to enable Moses to deliver Israel from slavery. There was no way Moses could have succeeded in his own strength. Decide not to be in a hurry with God. Wait on his timing for that next major step. If you cooperate with God, he can accomplish much while you wait. And there are key things to do as you wait his timing. You must never compare your life with others thinking that they have gone ahead of you or that you are better than they. Your life and destiny are peculiar to you. Firstly, you need to spend a lot of time seeking God in prayer about his plan. This enables you to get clarity on the definite steps he expects you to take towards his purpose. This is so important because you cannot wholeheartedly pursue a cause that you are not clear about, especially when it concerns your future you will eventually resort to your limited human wisdom and end up making a mess of your life like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden when they discovered their nakedness. All they could think of was to cover themselves with fig leaves which they had sown. But God, in his mercy, made clothes of skin for them, something much better. Man's wisdom was also evident when Abraham and Ishmael, with Hagar, an attempt at bringing God's promise to pass in his life, hastily. You cannot afford to take this lightly at all. Let God guide you all the way. Alongside prayers, meditation is key to walking in the wisdom of God, but prayer will also sharpen your discernment abilities. This is very important because you will come across good people who will offer you counsel, so you need the ability to identify which one comes from God. Furthermore, as you pray, Ask God for boldness to take those steps that he lays on your heart, because sometimes they might actually look scary. Secondly, after you are clear about the plan of God, the next thing for you is to prepare. And prayer is part of this as well. 
but preparation essentially entails learning as much as you can about where you are going. For instance, if God wants you to get married in the next two years, you should be busy learning all you can about marriage before then. You do this by reading relevant books and submitting to the counsel of spiritual leaders and older couples. If there is someone who you hope to be married to, then take time to carefully observe them and cultivate patience. Even if the goal ahead of you is to start a company 12 months from now, proper preparation is what will get you there. Assumptions will only guarantee failure, even if you have all the money needed. What you need is a clear vision of what you want to do and where you want to go. Focusing on what you are doing presently is another thing you should do while waiting for God's timing. It is possible for you to become so obsessed with the plan of God for you that you sacrifice your present opportunities. But the man Moses, while waiting for God's timing in the land of Midian, got married and raised a family. He also learned to be a shepherd in the house of Jethro, his father-in-law. And as a part of his ministry, the apostle Paul was a tent maker. There are people who abandon their families, friends, and occupations while pursuing what God has for them in the future. Some even quit school prematurely. Pay close attention to your family because it is your primary source of love, support, and comfort. Your family stands by you, whether you succeed or fail. Unless the Lord instructs you otherwise, you must also continue with any income-generating venture in which you are currently involved. The fourth thing you do while waiting for God is to restructure your life to accommodate the purpose of God. Your priorities as a single person, for instance, will need to be reordered and brought in line with your intent on getting married. There are adjustments that are needed for a marriage to work. For instance, you might need to step up your income generation drive. If you have a call from God for ministry, streamlining your relationships is a necessity so you can be committed to it. Relationships can be either a catalyst or a weight. You need friends and associates of like mind who can relate to the challenges of ministry before you. The Bible says that two are better than one, and Christ Jesus usually sent disciples in pairs. There are other examples in the early church, such as Peter and John, Paul and Barnabas, and Paul and Silas. Another wise thing to do while waiting for God's timing is to build a good relationship with a mentor. There are people who have gone through the process that you are about to enter, and you can draw from their wealth of wisdom and practical experience to make your journey smoother. For instance, you can avoid some of their pitfalls, connect with them and seek their counsel, read their books and listen to their messages. Look at the book of Hebrews at 6 verse 12. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Also see the book of Isaiah 51 verse 2. For I alone called him, blessed him, and increased him. Be a follower of men and women that have gone ahead. Clearly mentoring is a Bible leadership pattern. We can see mentorship in the relationship between Moses and Joshua. Even in the New Testament, we see the Apostle Paul mentoring the young man, Timothy. And of course, Jesus Christ mentored the 12 disciples. You don't need to be a complete novice when there are people whose footsteps you can follow. You don't have to be a preacher. You can be an aspiring singer, athlete, actor, writer, entrepreneur, or whatever. There are people who have proven themselves in these fields and others. Take advantage of them and learn. As you pray and wait for God's timing, he will point you to men. Now, you are talented and excited about your potential, but it does not end there. Look for opportunities to use your gifts to serve men voluntarily. Serve in your family, local church assembly, school, and community. Do not miss any platform given to you because your faithfulness to do it can lead to bigger platforms. Look at the young man, Joseph. He found himself in jail for a crime he never committed. Say no to any juicy offers that could take you off course. While in detention, Joseph served others. It did not look like his dreams would come to reality, but Joseph remained calm. You must guard your heart against an offense that could arise from betrayal. Be quick to forgive, 
Let God work in you before he works through you. Among the challenges you are likely to face is the tendency to become impatient, thinking that nothing is happening. It took 40 years for God to prepare Moses for his assignment. It also took King David many years to ascend the throne of Israel after he was anointed by the prophet Samuel. God has not given up on you. He knows what he is doing. Remember that Saul, David's predecessor, got into trouble because he was not willing to wait for Samuel to offer sacrifices. He is an example of someone who is impatient and untrained. Finally, do not turn the purpose of God into a personal ambition to be pursued ruthlessly. You are a vehicle for the purpose of God, and God is people-centered. Humanity is the beneficiary of all God does on earth. So consider it a privilege and an honor that God chose you. He did not stumble into you. It is not about your qualifications because God always picks unlikely men and qualifies them for his assignment. As you cooperate with God, he compensates and promotes you. Be willing to go where he leads and follow all instructions even if it inconveniences you. God also considers your attitude, and he is a very good rewarder. When he gives you a definite instruction, do not seek any man's opinion. Just go ahead and carry it out. His ways are higher than man's ways. It is just a matter of time. In order for me to communicate this message to you properly today, I knew I had to put myself in your shoes. I knew I had to be honest with myself about one thing. It can be quite difficult to keep believing that God is still working when everything in my life says otherwise. It can be difficult to believe God is still working when things are going well for others, and it seems for me, everything is going downhill. Maybe you have been praying about something, and instead of getting better, it just keeps getting worse. How do you believe God is still working in such a situation? Believe me, I know what it feels like to be in such a situation. However, I want to say this to you. Dare to believe God still. No matter where we are, the greatest good we can do ourselves is to keep believing that God is for us. Look, the world today doesn't encourage you to believe God, to trust the process of His working, doesn't want you standing on God's promises. It will push you so hard that you will begin to think God is actually against you. The world wants you to take control of your life by yourself. It wants you to suit up and go play your own hero. However, dear child of God, you belong to God. Your destiny is in His hands. You are so dear to Him that He considers it unrighteous to forget you. See how the following verses puts it. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 14 through 16. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are even before me. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Maybe you are sitting there right now looking at your life or situation and it seems nothing is happening. I want you to know without any shadow of doubt that even in that moment when it feels like nothing is happening, God is still working in the background. Remember what he has said in his word over every child of his. He has a plan for our destinies. And, though it may not look like it right now, that plan is to do you good. I don't know how. I can't even say I know what he is doing exactly. But allow me to encourage you with these words. Dare to keep believing God. Do you know that even before you started believing him, God already had you in mind? He had already begun working things out to save you even while you were yet to come to Him. Think about that for a moment. The Bible says that even while we, you and I, were still sinners, Christ died for us. God gave His Son to save you even before you acknowledged Him in your life. 
Before you stepped towards him, he was already running towards you. Before you called out to him, he had stretched out his hands towards you. Now, think for a moment. If he went this far to save you, do you think he would do all that to leave you the way you are or where you are right now? Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Many times we forget this very important information, but I am glad you are seeing this today. Be reminded, even when it doesn't look like it, God is still working. When it seems you have been applying for the job and no one wants to employ you, God is still working on your behalf. When it seems like you've been working and working, giving it your best, and no one seems to appreciate or even recognize you, God is still working. When it seems like your life is characterized by failure everywhere you turn, God is still working on your behalf. Listen, you don't need to understand all the details. Find strength in these words, God will never fail you. Even if it looks like he has, he never will. Can you imagine yourself in Joseph's shoes? Imagine yourself with all your dreams and visions and goals, running through life with the excitement of achieving them all. And then, like a pack of cards, everything comes crashing down. Imagine how Joseph must have felt when his own brothers were planning to kill him before they finally agreed to sell him into slavery. Imagine yourself in Joseph's place when he was reduced from the status of a rich kid, almost like a prince, to a slave in a strange land far away from home. He could not write a letter to his father. There was no phone to contact home. You would feel lost and alone, abandoned in such a situation. And even when things seemed to calm down a little and he was doing well in his master's house, he was framed by the master's wife and sent to prison without trial. Remember that this same Joseph refused to sin with Potiphar's wife because of his fear for God. Genesis chapter 39 verses 7 through 9. And after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her. My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in the house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? He was very conscious about pleasing God, but his own life would beg the question, where was God in all of this? Why didn't God exonerate him from all their accusations? Why did God allow him to go to prison? Where was God when he was being wrongly accused and then sent into the prison? But, you see, dear friend, we would fail to see God if we are so much in a haste, wanting everything the way we want. But if you look closely from the beginning, through the middle, and at the end of Joseph's life, God was involved. Even in his master's house, the Bible said that God was with him and granted him favor, making everything he did to prosper. Though it was a house of bondage, he still prospered there. He was exempted from the sufferings of the other servants. Most servants would have been killed, but God made it so that they would jail him instead. Why? Because Joseph was in line with a blueprint. God was working in the background. Everything was going according to plan. Even while in prison, God was with him and granted him favor. Look, how do I know God is always working and was working in Joseph's life even in this situation? It was no coincidence that Joseph got incarcerated in the royal prison. It was no coincidence that Pharaoh's servants offended him and he had them thrown into the same royal prison where Joseph was being held. It was no coincidence that both had a problem in that prison that only Joseph could solve. It was also no coincidence that Joseph's interpretation was spot on and happened just like he said it would. That is not all, my friend. Remember, I said, even when it doesn't look like it, God is still working. You must dare to keep believing. After all that happened, everything went back to the way they used to be. The servant was set free and he forgot Joseph. I would like to believe that God allowed him to forget. Why? Because according to his plans, 
If they released Joseph at once, he would not occupy the position God was preparing him for. Maybe he would become another servant, and God had something else in mind. Joseph was not meant to be a servant all his life. It was his destiny to rule, and everything was already in motion to bring him to that destiny. So, God made the servant forget Joseph for a while. It may have felt painful to help someone and be forgotten, but don't forget, God is still working. Don't conclude on your destiny when God hasn't. Dare to believe him, no matter what. Then fast forward to a couple years later, now it was time for Joseph's manifestation. It was time for his revelation, and for that to happen, there must be a grand entry. So what did God do? He allowed a problem to surface which only Joseph could solve. Pharaoh had a dream that no one of his wise men could solve. This was the time that the servant remembered Joseph. Do you see it? Everything that Joseph had done and had gone through was preparing him for this grand moment. This was the moment of his life, and oh boy, was he ready. Hear how the psalmist wrote about it. Psalms 105, verses 18 through 22. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. Till what he foretold came to pass, till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of people set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. You know the rest of the story. Joseph told the interpretation and added wise instruction to it. This pleased the king and all who witnessed Joseph. This was how he was promoted to become Egypt's prime minister under Pharaoh. However, in the grand scheme of things, God was fulfilling a plan through the destiny of Joseph that would save not only the Egyptian nation, but the Israelite race and other nations that would benefit from it during the famine. I don't know what you are going through or where you are right now. However, I want to plead with you, do not stop believing God. It is not your job to figure out how God answers or will answer you. It is not your job to know when He will answer you. He has given you one job, and that is to just believe. Jesus said in Mark chapter 5, verse 36, Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid. Just believe. Only believe, my friend. Don't stop believing. There's something I always tell people, and I believe this is a great time to tell you because what you hear is as important in influencing what you believe. I tell people, if you have strength for one more step, place it in front of you. God will never go back on what He has promised you if you keep your eyes and heart on Him. God is still healing the sick, my friend. Don't stop believing this. God is still raising the dead back to life. Don't stop believing this. God is still changing stories from shame to honor. Don't stop believing. God is still turning lives around. What do you need to do? Keep believing. If you will keep believing, you will reach the finish line. If you are struggling with believing God at the season of your life, I would like to encourage you to ask for his help right now. Like the father of that sick child in the Bible, honestly tell him, Father, I believe you. I want to believe you more than I do right now. Please help my unbelief. If there is any in me, help me to hope against all hope. Help me to believe against every doubt. I know you always hear me, and you will deliver me from this situation as you did Joseph. I will believe you. I will trust you for as long as I live, and I know that one day soon, all you promised me will come to pass. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Don't give up hope, dear child of God. God is still working miracles. Keep believing. All things are possible to those who believe. What is the meaning of waiting? Why do you need to wait on God? The importance of waiting how do I wait? Will God answer me? Consequences of not waiting. What does it mean to wait upon the Lord? In the scriptures, the word wait means to hope, anticipate, and trust. 
to hope and trust in the Lord. Waiting is an equal part of Christianity. As a child of God, you can't rush God. You can't box God into a corner to give you something now. Waiting is a virtue, but tasking. My 10-year-old once asked me why God doesn't answer our big requests, but only small, small prayers. Hmm, I asked, the prayers in particular? He said we should have plenty of money to pay our bills. Wow, I smiled and answered that God Almighty will definitely answer us someday. I wish I understand better too. The answer is here. Waiting means to hope for something. Evidence of things not seen, but you are expectant. The patience is a virtue that must be asked of God for anyone to wait. To wait for senior officers in the waiting room is too much to bear, not to talk of waiting endlessly for a prayer to be answered, but that is the right thing to do. I took the time to explain my personal experience on this topic, to let you know that you have to wait. As long as you are a human being, there are natural things you must wait for. We know the word wait means to expect or to look for, but remember, it also means to serve, just like a waiter waiting at your table at a restaurant. Our act of waiting isn't supposed to be spent sitting around passively, hoping that something will happen sometime soon. As you wait, ensure that you are doing something. God must find you serving, learning, and working on yourself. So, when what you ask for comes, it must meet you in the right frame of mind. An example is searching for jobs and trusting God for a job. As you wait patiently to get a job in the best organizations, start to work on your skills, get information about the organization, learn more about computers, learn more about the job description, expectations of a manager, and what you will be needing. Not that the job will come and you are found incomplete, while you wait, serve, learn new things. Why do you need to wait on God? Awesome God is our advocacy, our everything, and our all in all. He is sovereign over all things, and we depend on Him for our very next breath. So let us express our dependency by waiting patiently, avoiding worry, living obediently, while seeking Him in prayer and expecting Him to save us as we long for Christ's final return. If a man holds the key to your house, and you do not have a spare one, what will you do without breaking the house? You just have to wait patiently until he comes to the door. As you wait, what do you need while waiting? You need faith, patience, humility, meekness, long-suffering, keeping the commandments, and enduring to the end. To wait upon the Lord means planting the seed of faith and nourishing it. We need to believe and trust that waiting on God is worth it. You have to be humble, respect yourself, and be lowly at heart. Let us look at planting. If you drop a seed into the soil, it doesn't spring up immediately. It takes a lot of processes. You must irrigate it, water it, and weed it. Possibly apply a fertilizer. Starting a business takes its procedure. You just have to wait. James 5, 7 and 8 Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. From the scriptures above, it is clear that waiting is part of the Christian journey of life. Nothing is done without its procedure. Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. If it's slow, wait for it. It's worth waiting for. If God assures you about a thing, you can go to sleep. 
When people promise you, they may fail, but God is not a man to fail or lie. If he asks you to wait, he will surely fulfill it, except if you don't it. To protect you and preserve you, he may possibly not give you. There is joy in waiting on God, as he will not lie or compromise. God is God. He can never fail, because he doesn't know what it is to fail. He will never, ever fail you. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Let your trust be complete. Don't lean on your knowledge, beauty, intelligence, the number of people you know, and your competencies. Lean on God completely and show Him your dependency on Him. I am nothing without you, Lord. God loves you and needs you to surrender completely to Him. All the world can fail you, but God will never fail you. He is the only sure assurance. How do I wait? Wait as you pray fervently. Pray and wait until He answers you, patiently waiting for your answers to come. God is good only to those who wait on Him. Wait on God by keeping His ways. You must be determined to wait as people or even close family and friends will mock you. With determination, you will surely win the battles of life. If you are in a hurry or panned, angered, feel that all my friends had gone far but see where I am, that is the reason you need God in your life. Wait on God and He would lead your way. The timing of God is absolutely different. He does things within the twinkle of a second. You will start to wonder how, and the same people will praise God Almighty for your life. I have a testimony of a great pastor who wanted to marry his childhood friend, Sister Mary. Unfortunately, she said she was not ready. She told the pastor to go and marry since he was ready. The pastor went his way to another city where I reside. He met another sister, got married, and they lived happily for over 30 years. They had four children and became successful in their endeavors, all married too. Their mom passed on to glory a few years back. Guess what? The pastor who is aged now got married to his childhood friend and she gave birth to twins. She had everything she wanted. She waited as a virgin for almost 55 years. The ways of God are not our ways. His time is not our time. All you need do is wait. The patience is a virtue. Wait on God. Consequences of not waiting on God. The moment you get ahead of God is the moment you stepped out of His will. A lady was so much in a hurry to make it in life, get married, and have children. These are things you don't need to get in a hurry. She got her wealth in a crude way, built her house, and met a drug baron who married her, settled down to enjoy her ill-gotten wealth. Alas, she passed on. She did not live to enjoy it. What is the lesson here? Wait on God to take the lead in your life and direct your path. What are the possible consequences? Bitterness, sorrows, anger, pains, and disappointments. No peace of mind. Things may likely not work as planned. Even if it works, it's usually temporal. It does not last. King Saul was out of the will of God when he offered a sacrifice before going to war. The passage 1 Samuel 13, 13 and 14 shares the consequences of not waiting on God. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Instead, the Lord sought a new king to replace Saul. This is a typical example of not waiting on God, but doing the dictates of the body and souls, you can't help God. God knows what is best for you. He will not give you something that will destroy you, but things that will honor and bring glory to Him. Ask God for what you need by faith and trust that God will answer your prayers. Patiently wait for answers. Waiting on God will help you work in His will. You will not work outside His will, 
and if you are in the will of God, you are victorious. Working in God's will will make God answer your prayers, and your faith is strengthened in Him. Fear of the unknown, uncertainty, and lack of faith would make you not wait on God to lead you. I want to be this and that within a stipulated time. Microwave Christianity will make you in a hurry. If you can't wait on God, it would be disastrous. Wait and let God lead you throughout the leading of your life. Prayer is the explicit acknowledgement that we can do nothing without Christ. And prayer is turning away from ourselves and toward God, trusting that He will offer the assistance we seek. Prayer humbles ourselves as needy people while exalting God as affluent people. He is eager to speak with us. He desires for us to get to know Him. He was hoping for a romantic connection with you. He wants you to reveal everything about your life, including the seemingly little details. I hope that these prayer quotes not only encourage, but also motivate you to start a new prayer routine in your life. Find a comfortable spot where you can spend time alone with Him every day. Gratitude is the quality of your thanksgiving in response to a good deed you receive. Gratitude is a force that, when understood, can transform you into the best version of yourself. However, if you do not fully comprehend gratitude and the powers that underpin it, you risk putting your life and destiny through unnecessary stress and battles. Child of God, the reason why you come out of every victory with scars and so much damage might not be unconnected to your understanding of gratitude. I've seen how the lives of the consciously thankful and how much ease they enjoy throughout the Bible and even in recent times. There is enormous power in gratitude, and I want to show you today how gratitude releases the power to handle our life's challenges. Gratitude carries the power of wholeness. Yes, child of God, you heard that right. Gratitude carries the power of completion and wholeness. There's a story in the Bible about Jesus and some 10 lepers that he healed. After the hearing, nine of the 10 men didn't come back except the one man who went back to where Jesus was sitting. The Bible says in Luke 17, 15 through 16, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. In verse 19, Jesus noticed that only one of these men returned to appreciate him for the healing then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you whole. The nine other men were healed, which means the disease eating away at their skin was healed. But the one man who returned, the Bible says, was made whole. That means his already battered skin was restored. Every sign that showed that he had leprosy would have disappeared completely restored to its original human form just because he came back to show his gratitude. I say this to you again, child of God. Gratitude carries the power of wholeness and completion. Your life might be going through some leprous stages right now. So many situations are gnawing away at your joy and resources. Every time you make a little money, something comes up from somewhere until that money is finished. Your health might be going through different doctor's diagnoses and medical procedures, but just as Jesus said to that man who came back to say thank you to him, your faith has made you whole. I give you today the power of gratitude and wholeness in your situations. Being grateful is good medicine. Another power of gratitude, what I am going to show you 
is the power of ease. That's right, ease. We all face battles and we all go through tribulations. Some people face bigger battles than others. But just as the sun and snow do not shine on one person and not on the other, we all have our own challenges and battles that we fight every day. We all fail at some of these challenges and we lose some of the battles that we fight. In the same way, you too may have lost some. But if you are alive and reading this, then you have won many more victories than you have lost. Now, the difference between the victory of an ungrateful heart and that of a heart full of thanksgiving is the ease in which their victories come. Many people bear scars from battles and challenges in life that they had to win tooth and nail. At the end of the battle, there was a victory nonetheless, but it was scarred by the end. After the death of Moses, the mantra fell on Joshua to lead the people of Israel. On their way to the promised land lay a city that God commanded to be taken. The ranks of Israel had gathered and were ready for a fight. They were almost certain to win because they had God on their side. But there stood a wall before them, surrounding the city, and even if they won the battle, the wall was going to make them take so many casualties because it was impregnable. Scars from that battle were sure. The ranks of Israel would have taken a huge loss, but a victory nonetheless. But child of God, in the book of Joshua 6.20, the Bible says, When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and the men praised. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Child of God, when you express gratitude, praise, and thanksgiving, you begin to ride easily into victories. Because the troubles of the world would not end, your understanding of the power of ease and gratitude would ensure that you come out of every battle unscathed. I feel like telling you to stop putting your life through unnecessary stress today just by engaging God in gratitude. Gratitude carries the power that guarantees sustenance and multiplication. Some of the greatest miracles in history were performed by Jesus on the back of instant thanksgiving. The book of Matthew tells the story of a group of people gathering and listening to Jesus' teachings. After a while, he noticed the people were hungry, and he told his disciples to tell the people to sit down for food. In this particular crowd, the Bible records about 5,000 people in attendance, and Jesus only had two fish and five loaves of bread that a little boy had in his possession. But the miracle happened in the same book of Matthew. 14 verse 19 and he directed the people to sit down on the grass taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven he gave thanks and broke the loaves then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people they all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over listen to me child of God Gratitude carries the power to sustain you and multiply the blessings of God in your life. Hear me, child of God. Your gratitude will bring you more opportunities in God. Your gratitude to God is an expression of total obedience and recognition of the fact that He alone gave you that victory or that blessing. Your thanksgiving, child of God, is a demonstration of your approval in God's process. When you do not engage in thanksgiving with God in His dealings with you, it is a communication of your disapproval of His process with you and your self-sufficiency. Gratitude is the ultimate expression of faith. It is you telling God that you know only He is strong and mighty enough to have done that and you are grateful for his process and you trust it completely. In Proverbs 3, verse 5, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Trust in God. The whole foundation of God's dealings with you is rooted in trust. Can two walk together unless there is an agreement? Of course, the answer is no. The affairs of your life are left to your own steering until you forget all you think you know and surrender the steering of your life completely into the hands of God. This takes the faith of a strong heart. Many times you are faced with situations that you think you can see the answers to clearly. In your mind's eye, you have already proffered a solution and the process of achieving it has already been patterned out. But then God speaks to you and his solution is a different approach. Your ability to decide to follow his own directions rather than depending on your human mind is your absolute trust in God. And that is what he needs to operate on your behalf. Trust in God's process, child of God. Trust in him. The Bible says, and he will make your paths straight. That is the reason why you must trust in him. When I was growing up, one of my favorite songs that my mother would teach us on Sunday evenings after family dinner was My God Knows the Way Through the Wilderness. All I have to do is follow him. Following God starts with trusting in his process. Things might not be going according to your plans now. Trust the process. Your age mates seem to be doing way better than you and you do not want to be where they are because you feel inferior to them. Trust the process. Your age group is all married or married to be and you are still unattached. Trust the process. That is an absolute declaration of total surrender of your life and process to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You will come face to face with things that make you afraid you will come to an environment where you are treated different from others because you have decided to trust God and people do not understand why you are not doing the obvious things that will solve your problems. People will criticize your decision to follow God's process rather than your own. You will face some crises alone when you expect your friends to be there. In fact, you are almost certain they will be holding your hands and going through the battles with you. You will face situations that will push you into the corner and try to squeeze the life out of you. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. He said he had not called the seed of Jacob to serve him in vain. He has not called you to follow him and trust in his process in vain. God has a plan for you. If you can look into the heart of God through his word, you will see a clear picture of yourself in the mirror of the Word of God. For example, consider his words to you in the book of Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has a plan for you he is not asking for your trust so that he can derail your life. His plans for you are for good and not for evil. He wants you to trust him to deliver you at the end that you planned with him. The reason why many people in the world are going through battles that seem to be drowning them is that they have continued to try to lead their own lives. They want to do things the way they like and take decisions in their lives just the way they like. Such actions have condemned millions to a life of regret and bitterness. But God says he has a plan for you and all you need to do is trust the process. Let go of your own understanding. God knows the way through every wilderness, every forest of life, every situation. God has removed, God has a plan God has a process. Trust that process.
What do you think your purpose is on this planet? Don't you want to make the most money possible? Are you here to start a family and raise it? Are you here to make a name for yourself? There's nothing wrong with it. But do we believe that's God's ultimate expectation for us each day? If not, what does God need of us on a daily basis? We know what He wants us to do and what He doesn't. Do not deceive. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Don't be envious of others' possessions. Do not disgrace your father and mother. Don't slander God's name. Only God should be worshipped. Keep the Sabbath sacred. Don't worship idols, and so forth. Today, let us take a look at what God expects of us each day as believers. With the growth of technology, most of us have developed the habit of checking our phones as soon as we wake up. If you try and quit this tendency and instead spend your time with God, your connection with Him will improve. Thank God for another day by reading your Bible and listening to worship music for a few minutes. We have moments during the day when we forget to worship God. We forget that He's constantly present and guarding us. We don't always praise Him as much as He deserves. God desires a deep connection with you, and He desires that you seek Him out regularly in prayer and supplication. This is the will of God, and He wants you to do this every day, every minute, every second of your existence. Listen to what David, the great psalmist, has to say about thanking God each morning in the book of Psalm 143, 8. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Psalm 5.3 In the morning, O Lord, hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my needs in front of you, and I wait. Our shepherd is the Lord, and he's our refuge from the storm. He's the one who loves with a never-dying love, and is a companion who clings closer than a brother, since the Lord's loving kindness never ceases and our Heavenly Father's compassion and mercy provide an endless supply. You must believe in our Father and never question His loving kindness, which is new every morning, just as David did. And you must cry out to our Heavenly Father, asking Him to show you the path you should walk, for God is the one who cleanses your soul. God's plan and goals for us are written forth in His Word, and the Bible should be the unmovable basis upon which we place our faith in Him. It takes practice and discipline to spend time with God every morning. Many things will try to lure us away and distract us, but we must ignore them and create time for our Lord. The enemy frequently attempts to meddle in our lives by convincing us that we don't have time for prayer and meditation and that we will make time later in the day to spend with God. When you start each day with God, he directs you in the right direction because He knows what awaits you. Trusting Him entails spending time with Him to plan your day according to His will. He will lead you down every route you take. He truly adores you. He wants the best for you. Giving thanks to God is the second thing God wants you to do every day. He wants you to be grateful every day that you're alive and well. Seeing you whine all the time does not make him happy. He wants you to be grateful for even the tiniest things in life. Why should we be thankful? We should do nothing else and nothing less just because we're God's creation. God's benevolence brings us joy. Giving gratitude and worship are two ways we accomplish this. The term meaning thanks in New Testament gives us the phrases grace and Eucharist. We express gratitude as we commemorate Jesus' spilled blood and beaten body by celebrating the Lord's Supper. Giving gratitude should be at the center of your life in worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. 1 Chronicle 16, 34 If God's love is eternal, you may be assured that God will never abandon you. He will always be patiently waiting for you no matter how long it's been since you last talked to Him. God is always gracious to you. God still has affection for you, even if you aren't quite good to Him. Not that God will always be gentle and easy on you. 
He will speak up and bring justice when required. But he will always be kind because he wants the best for you, his child. He's also kind and modest at heart. According to the Bible, God will prioritize you because you come first. God is selfless, sending his only son to die for you. And he has huge plans for you that will not fail. Your sins are not held against you by God. When you make a mistake and beg for forgiveness, God never keeps it against you. God enjoys telling you the truth. God will never deceive you and will always tell you the truth. God will always keep you safe from the devil and even from yourself when you make wrong moves. God protects his child from danger and the adversary by erecting a hedge of safety around you, signaling to the enemy that you are his. This does not imply you'll never be harmed, but God is constantly close by, shielding you from dangers you are unaware of. God will never let you down. You can always rely on God because He always delivers. And the least you can do in response to all of God's benevolence is to be thankful every day. I bring you to the third thing God wants you to practice each day. Love others. It's difficult to love others while we're unhappy with them. Make a conscious effort to love people and reflect God's light on them in every scenario. Be the good, godly influence that others, particularly those who do not know the Lord, require. God is the source of love. When you have heat, you have fire. When you have light, you have the sun. There is no love without God. You cannot separate the two. God's nature encompasses love. Love is proof that a person was created by God. It makes sense. If God lives inside you and love comes from God, you should love. Since you were created in the image of God, you should reflect that love. 1 John 4, 7-12 Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. If God sent His Son to stand in your place and suffer your punishment, then you should love those who appear to be your enemies. However, when we consider how Jesus stood in our place, even though we didn't deserve it, the word enemy no longer seems appropriate. If God allowed Jesus to fulfill all God's anger so that you would not come under God's wrath, then you should not hold others in your wrath, but rather guide them to the truth. What happens finally when you love properly? You shall be able to see God. His love will be perfected in you, which means it will achieve its full maturity. No one will be able to physically see God. However, people will recognize God by our love. Instead of praying for your enemies to perish, pray and love them every day, regardless of what they've done to you. Love for the world came from the Father's heart to a world of lost sinners. And love pours new life into the dead spirit of everyone who believes in His name. And the Apostle of Love implores us to love one another because God is love, and love is of God. As we are fed and renewed with His love in our hearts, Love flows from God's heart to us, and love is to flow through us to others. God's essence is love, and the fruit of His Spirit, which is anchored in love, has sprung forth from Him. Finally, God desires Christians to study the Bible every day. He wants you to always be curious about Him, and the only place you can discover answers is in the Bible. God has provided us with a plethora of Bible information to assist us. I'm presenting information that's been revealed to me via my personal life experiences. I must acknowledge that I do not have all the answers, but I can direct you to a resource that will assist you in discovering your God-given calling, the Bible. 
to live a life of passion and purpose. I believe we must continue to learn about Jesus Christ and what He believes our mission in life is. We were made in His image, thus many of His character characteristics are ones we should strive to emulate on a daily basis. Mark 13, 31. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. We embrace eternal life through embracing His word, clinging to it, delving into it, reading, believing it, and allowing it to change us. This is a crucial concept to comprehend and live by. Consider today the simple reality that everything in life passes away, save our Lord's teachings. Ask God to help you pay closer attention to Him and cling to His every word. All that He's spoken and shown us will last forever. And these truths are the only things in life worth striving for. Focus your attention on God's word and attempt to comprehend its deeper significance so that you can start accumulating riches in heaven right now.